the goal of today is to understand computing a little bit more, and in particular, apply it to protein sequence data. Um, this is just a, uh, we start with computing approaches and we translate it to protein sequence databases, and then we continue this discussion uh, on Friday. Um, I've also made a quick addition to uh, the PDF uh, handouts, so these uh, pink links and links in blue are actual uh, links now, so you can just click on this and it will open up an email window where you can email me, uh, and I'll show you examples of that as we go on as well. Also, in case you haven't uh, had a chance to experiment with this, at the top here there is a uh, list of the main topics in the lecture, and clicking on these will take you to the respective uh, pages in the PDF as well. As always, let's start with an overview. So I got a few questions pertaining to last week's lecture, and I'm going to be taking, or so I'm sorry, week two's lecture, and I'm going to be uh, answering them today. Then we're going to look at, again, we're going to look at this week's title, because I think that's very helpful to understand the material. Um, we're then going to look a little bit at programming languages and tools. And before we end off, we're going to look at protein sequence databases. We're going to start looking at them at least. Okay. So I've put this slide up just with the, the, the three major questions that I got from people. Um, and I've uh, broken this down. So let's just move right ahead to the first question. <coughs> so this was the first part of the first question that I got. And I've highlighted the key words in the question. So why is it that codes are described as simple, yet it is so complex in length? Now, I'm hoping I've understood the question correctly. And this is my answer. So let's define the terms. As always, this is a nice way to kind of get your head around a question. It could be an exam question. It could be a scenario question. It could be uh, anything, really. But uh, let's define the, the key words that I've uh, highlighted. <coughs> Code. Code is a subset of characters, so letters or numbers, that you have available to represent any, some particular information. Simple, for example, DNA code, is represented by four letters. So it's very simple. All of the DNA in uh, various genomes can be represented with just these four letters. And in fact, in real life, each letter represents a single nucleic acid. So all of the human genome, for example, is represented by just four nucleic acids. Now, there are exceptions. There are fifth and modified amino acid or uh, nucleic acids uh, and things like that. But the basic four nucleic acids are what you find in DNA. And so the, the person asking the question is absolutely right. It is very simple. So <clears throat> what do we mean by complex? So the question alludes to complexity and length, but complexity is actually affected by two factors. It's affected by the length of the sequence and the combination of this simple language that we have, this code that we have. So here's a very simple example. Let's just take a look at possible combinations of DNA bases. If a genome of an organism contained 100 bases, now this will never happen, but just as, a, uh, as an example, let's keep it easy. Each position of the sequence, so it's, it's 100 letters long. Each position, you could have one of four letters in it, because DNA, again, has four letters that we use to represent it. So how many total possible combinations of 100 bases could we have? So the first position has four, the second position has four choices, the third position has four choices, and so on and so forth. That's four times four times four times four, so on and so forth, and you multiply four 100 times. In other words, it's four raised to the power of 100. This is a huge number. Biology obviously does not work on these uh, on all of these combinations. Some of these combinations will not produce life. It is a very specific set of these letters that will produce life. So we have a viable subset. However, the complexity is affected by the length. So in this case, we have 100 bases. 
and each position has four choices, so that's complex. Uh, so that's the length, that's 100 bases, and then the combination, that is, um, how are these bases put together in sequence. <coughs> The uh, second part of that first question was, are there new methods of coding in bioinformatics to make information storage easier? Or two, is it that data storage devices are just getting larger to compensate? This is an excellent question. Thank you for asking. So <clears throat> historically, it was the first case we had algorithms that kept getting developed that would uh, try very hard to make the problems as small as possible because we just didn't have the kind of storage that we have today. However, increasingly, as I've said in the previous lecture, disk space is very, very cheap. And hardware, um, especially networking hardware and storage hardware are getting cheaper by the day and they're also getting more reliable. So nowadays, the answer is more on the lines of two, that data storage devices are just getting larger to compensate. However, more recently, there has been a renewed enthusiasm, at least in, in some of the work that I do with proteins, there has been a new effort to try to get algorithms to behave uh, more efficiently. So not just throwing larger and larger disks at the same old algorithms, but actually optimizing the algorithms themselves to work better with the storage that we have. Um, however, for now, the answer is number two, that the data storage devices, you, just, you can just keep adding disks to uh, make this problem uh, go away temporarily before you get more data and you have to do this again. So the next question was very good. Um, how are replicates treated in databases even though you curate them over time? And what measures are in place for people not to mix up replicates and um, essentially not to get the old data confused with the new data? So again, I hope I've understood your question correctly. The answer, plain and simple, it really depends on the database. But the crux of the argument is that um, Databases like the Protein Data Bank or GenBank, uh, they never delete data. And this is something to remember. If you have new data that directly is a better version or better curated version of something that already exists, the new data supersedes or obsoletes the old data. The old data is very much still available, but the new data there is a little flag on the data that says this replaces something else. And this is an example of metadata. So I briefly touched on this in my last lecture, but uh, any data that you have has to have metadata that tells you what the data is. So you could have a DNA sequence. That's your data. Your metadata is, well, what sequence is it? What organism is it from? What, uh, what version of the sequence is it? Like I said, if there's a newer sequence available, maybe that's a version two, uh, and you end up looking at version one in a database, the metadata will say that this is version one. Um, it will also store other information about the person who deposited the sequence into the database, so the authors. Uh, it will store information about related publications to the sequence. This is all metadata that is built on top of the data. So again, remember now that the storage issue gets uh, exponentially larger because you need to have storage not only to store your data, but the metadata as well. And uh, the metadata is part of the database also. So when you search for data, you're going to get all the metadata with it. We're gonna look at this with uh, one of the protein sequence databases later today. So this is one of my favorite questions, and it essentially is asking me what advice I would give uh, new bioinformaticians, people such as yourselves, uh, to boost speed and storage on laptops and PCs that you may have without, essentially, without spending money where you don't need to spend money. And there's also a little question on uh, pen drives or USB devices, Dropbox and Google Drive. 
And finally, it ends with how can we maintain our systems without crowding them with information? So think back to week two. Uh, one of the things I had said was, you are almost never going to have full copies of the human genome, for instance, on your local machine. It will be available on some kind of a network storage device in your university or in your local network or something like that. And any large bioinformatics application or sequencing facility or anything like that is going to require data storage servers. Effectively, Dropbox and Google Drive are doing this for you. But uh, they are not optimized for the kinds of data that we work with. So we work with plain text data, but also we are constantly, constantly accessing the databases uh, and repositories. We're constantly accessing these files. When we run a bioinformatics pipeline, it is constantly accessing this information. So Dropbox and Google Drive aren't designed for this sort of continuous access. One of the reasons is the network geography. Dropbox isn't located on your university campus. Uh, so this is why we have uh, local storage servers in almost any bioinformatics facility. Now one of the great things about bioinformatics is that it is one field where very clearly the more storage you have, the more things you can do um, and the more f uh, services you can offer as a bioinformatics facility. So I hope that answers uh, the question and it was a, a very good one. And again, please keep sending them in um, if you feel like uh, you want more information. Right, so let's move on to this week. Dissecting the title. Remember, I always like to do this and I hope it's been useful for you in, the, uh, in my past lecture. Uh, so we're going to do it again. Computing approaches and protein sequence databases. So last week we ended with the mindset of the bioinformatician and I get a feeling that this is why many of you wanted to know more about the actual computational element of bioinformatics. Um, I, as I mentioned many times last time, I was trying to stay away from that uh, and not get into the hardcore computational programming aspects but today I do want to spend a bit of time showing you an example of something that I would do almost every day in, uh, in my lab. <coughs> and last, uh, last time we spoke, we also talked about databases. And today we're going to look at one particular repository of uh, protein sequence data. And then we will revisit this further on Friday. So I want to start by giving you a brief introduction to programming languages. <clears throat> a programming language is a formal language with a specific vocabulary. It is like every other language. It is like Latin, English, French. It is like all of the languages that you speak every day. It has a formal vocabulary in order to communicate ideas, except in this case, the ideas are instructions to a computer. And the computer takes these instructions and it does tasks with it. The instructions that you write as part of the programming language is uh, colloquially referred to as the code. So when people say computer code or I'm coding, what they're saying is I'm writing instructions in a computer language, in a programming language. Uh, programming languages are human readable, but at the end of the day, no matter what programming language you use, they're all going to get converted to binary, zeros and ones, on and off. That's all the computer understands. It's basically a giant electrical circuit. So you have hundreds of thousands of switches or transistors in the computer that know on or off, zero or one. And the process of turning the human readable language into binary is called compiling or compilation. And it's done with a special software tool known as a compiler. And each programming language has a compiler that converts that programming language into binary. Well, we have many choices, but the choice you make if you are writing your own software is very important because each programming language gets converted to binary 
at various efficiencies. So there are many ways to solve a problem. One programming language may get reduced to a set of binary instructions that can solve the problem in four steps. Another programming language may take eight steps. So the code that is uh, converted to the four-step binary program is going to run faster than the eight-step. Now, this doesn't seem like a big deal for your day-to-day -day operations, but when we deal with large data sets in bioinformatics, these little trade-offs in speed and efficiency make a huge difference. So that's one reason many computer scientists know many different programming languages. They use the one that is most suitable to the task that they are trying to achieve. And before we get into listing some, I want to quickly discuss what a scripting language is. A scripting language is basically a lightweight programming language. Uh, it doesn't require compiling in the same way that programming languages do. And it's generally easier to, to use and it's easier to learn. But on the flip side, scripting languages are not usually designed for heavy computation. So. The first language I want to discuss is C and its derivative, C++. PL in brackets means programming language, by the way. And this is the godfather. If you want to do anything on a, on a heavy computational scale, uh, you're going to be writing in C or C++. Operating systems are written in C and C++. Windows, Mac OS X, GNU Linux, these are all written in C and C++ because they're they provide the fastest possible execution. On the flip side, it's not very easy to do simple things. And it does require more knowledge about your operating system and the hardware that you use. Python and Perl. Um, Python is both a programming language and a scripting language, uh, depending on how it's configured and how you write your code and Perl, which is a, a pure scripting language, which, which is not strictly true. It does have elements of uh, compiling in it as well, but uh, definitely compared to Python, uh, Perl is a pure scripting language. And this is the one you would have heard of if you have ever spoken to a bioinformatician, uh, these two, Python and Perl. Bioinformaticians prefer them because they make it very easy to work, especially with files. And a bioinformatician spends most of his or her life opening files and parsing the text content or pulling out the text content, doing something with the text content, manipulating text. And Perl and Python are very quick at it. Python is actually much more powerful. You can do many more things with it than you can with Perl. And it also provides very useful features uh, for bioinformaticians. We're going to look at some Python later. Perl used to be the standard, and in many facilities it still is the standard, but in my opinion, Python provides all of the speed that Perl does uh, and many, many uh, more features, and it's also just as quick to write uh, code in Python as it is in Perl. Uh, Java is a programming language. Um, the benefit with Java is that when you compile Java code, it will run on any computer where you have the Java runtime or the Java virtual machine. I'm sure you've seen the installers for the Java uh, runtime and the virtual machine. Uh, but the problem with Java is that it's slow for heavy computation. And a lot of people will disagree with me, but plain and simple, Java is built upon an extra layer in between the actual hardware of the computer and uh, say, um, then say C++. C++, you write your code, it turns into binary, it talks directly to the hardware. In Java, you write your code, it turns it into something called bytecode, which then speaks to the virtual machine, which then speaks to the hardware. So there's that extra layer in the middle, which takes time and it slows things down. I never program in Java. I know how to program in Java, but I avoid it because uh, I just don't like it. Um, I think Python and C++ provide more than enough features for doing anything you'd want to do and doing it much quicker than Java can. So, if you are writing your own code, which programming language should you use? 
Well, it depends on what you want to do. If you want to work with files, Python or Perl, definitely. They are the easiest to uh, work with files. Um, let's say you have developed a new approach to uh, perform some complex calculation or computation or simulation. I would recommend Python, and obviously I would recommend a small testing data set so uh, it runs fast enough for you to see the results. And then let's say you have decided that your program works and you want to deploy your code in, a, in an industrial level if you want your code to run as fast as possible, I would then write that in C or C++. And what if you want to work with files and run large heavy computations because, like I said, bioinformaticians spend a lot of time working with files and then they pull out the data from the files and then they perform heavy computation on it. Well, I use Python with C++. And uh, I will discuss this further as we go on. But essentially, I use Python for my file handling, and then I use C++ for the heavy computation. And it works very well. So the summary is, if you are looking to learn a good, program, uh, a good first programming language, I would recommend Python. Because uh, it's, it's quite easy to learn. And also, there is a module in Python called BioPython that makes it extremely easy to work with biological data. Perl has something called BioPerl, but um, I still think Python is uh, preferable. If you don't know programming and you want to get into it, Python is definitely the way to go. We're going to look at some BioPython later today. So, as I mentioned, uh, just as a side note, this is not particularly important or interesting, but uh, I mentioned uh, that I use Python with C++, and, and this is called modularity, um, where I have a certain functionality, like file handling, that I write in Python, and then I do the heavy computation in C++. Now, these two pieces of code, they work together, but they live separately. And this is very important. Modularity in software is a key concept. It makes your code very easy to maintain, debug, change, extend the functionality later. So let's say I have, um, so initially I used my Python for the file handling. And then I was testing this algorithm that I was building. And I wrote that in Python because it's easier to write code in Python. And I put those two modules together and I tested it on a small data set and I was happy with the results. Then I wrote that computation element in C++ and I replaced the Python version with the C++ version. And this did not affect my file handling code at all. My file handling code continued to operate exactly as it did. I just replaced the heavy computation element and I changed the module. So each of these pieces is called a module. This modularity is very good. You can plug and play different elements, um, and you can kind of create very diverse software based on the needs of the user. Um, as a graphical example, this is a piece of software called Sonogen. Um, and this is a, uh, an audio uh, program, which has different effects and things. And you can see the, uh, the cables in between, the yellow cables and the red cables. Each of these boxes is a module, OK? And you can see that this module is connected to this one, which is then connected to this one. It's also then connected to this voice mixer out here. This is modularity. I can literally plug and play like cables into different modules, and I can get different kinds of output. So modularity is very important in software. Also, at the bottom, I've put a further reading. Um, this man's name is Model, which is, I think, a great surname and very relevant to modeling and computation in general. Uh, Mitchell Model in 2009 wrote a book called Bioinformatics Programming Using Python. Um, this is a successor to the very popular Perl version of this same um, book. And uh, if the examples are anything like the Perl version, I think this book is very useful for you to learn Python from a bioinformatics perspective. OK, it's uh, time for our first demo today. There's two demos, and this is uh, our first one. 
Um, I'm going to do some uh, programming in Python and show you uh, some of the work that uh, I would do on a, on a regular basis. And we're going to look at protein sequences because that is the topic for this week. Uh, and before we actually talk about the databases, I want to show you some examples, uh, well, an, exa an example with uh, some FASTA file manipulation in Python. So. In this demo, I'm going to show you how I work with FASTA files in Python, and I'm going to use the BioPython uh, modules and packages. So we're going to open a DNA file in FASTA format, we're going to parse it, and then we're going to find out the lengths of the sequence, uh, the length of the sequence. And then we're going to translate it to the resulting amino acid uh, or the protein sequence. So from DNA, we're going to go to RNA. So remember from your biology, that that's called transcription. And then we're going to go to protein, which is the translation. Uh, by the way, a parser, so I've used this word before, and just, just to clear any doubts if there are any, a parser is, is something that takes input data and converts it into a, a data structure or something that you can work with based on a set of rules. So a parser knows, for instance, with FASTA files, that it needs to look for the little, uh, little greater than sign at the beginning of the FASTA file to, uh, to uh, work with the description. And, and I'll show you some examples of this, but effectively, BioPython has a parser to work with FASTA files. Um, and we're going, to be, uh, we're going to be doing this now. So, um, and without further ado, I'm going to now minimize this PDF. And I'm going to just get our terminal up and running. OK, so I have been given a DNA sequence. And this is what the DNA sequence looks like. OK, it's a, it's a FASTA file. Like I said, it's got that greater than in the, in, in the header there. And this is the description. So it's not very helpful. We don't know what this DNA sequence is. And then this is the AT, uh, G and C uh, bases to uh, represent the actual DNA, uh, the DNA nucleic acids. So we're going to start by running IPython, which is an interactive Python. So it allows me to write Python code line by line. So the first thing is we need to import uh, the BioPython packages and modules and features that we need. Now again, if you're not a computer scientist, if you don't understand what I'm doing with the actual Python here, don't worry about it. Uh, I'm just showing this to you more as an example of the kinds of uh, manipulation we can do with, uh, with files. Okay, so from bio, which is what the BioPython package is called, it's, it's just called bio. Uh, I'm going to import something called seek.io, which is the uh, input-output uh, module for working with sequence data. So here we have sequences in a FASTA format, and seek.io has a bunch of functions in it that I can use to manipulate that, that text file. Okay, no errors means good. It uh, accepted that line. So let's continue. Um, I'm going to declare a variable um, called myDNA. Um, and I'm just going to set it to none for now. Again, this is all uh, Python kind of uh, semantics in the language. If you have any specific questions about any of these lines of code, please do email me about it. I understand that uh, this may be intimidating for some of you, but I still think it's a very useful example to go through. OK, so my DNA is a variable, and it's nothing right now. <clears throat> now, this is where Python gets very powerful. Now. In this file, we have a single FASTA sequence, but we could potentially have more than one. So let's say I've never looked at this uh, text file before. I want to run a loop which goes through every single uh, FASTA sequence in this uh, file. So I'm going to create a simple for loop for um, x in, here's where it gets powerful, seekio.parse. Now parse is a function within the seekio library here that we imported above in line one, that lets me open a file. And I can use uh, the tab key to call this test DNA file here. Tab just lets me enter everything without having to type every letter. And parse actually also needs the format, and that's FASTA. 
And in the for loop, what do we want to do? We want to just pull the data out for the time being. So my DNA equals x. That's all I'm going to do. So for every FASTA sequence it finds inside this file, it's going to set it uh, into this variable my DNA, so we can do something with it later. Okay. So now what this has done is seek.io has opened this file, it has treated it like a FASTA file because I've told it to, and it has then gone through and pulled out every FASTA sequence and allocated this into this my DNA variable so we can access it later. Okay. Now in our case we only had one. Um, so let's just see what's inside my DNA. Okay. So my DNA says that it has something called a seek record, which is a BioPython uh, object, and it's got some extra information about it. Well, this is a little bit unhelpful, so I'm going to print the actual data. Now we're getting somewhere. Um, it's detected that the ID, which is in the FASTA header, is something called unknown DNA sequence, so we have that here. It's allocated that to the name as well, because there's no particular uh, way that we have said that there is a name to this. And this is what the parser is doing. It's taking this text file, it's applying a set of rules to the text file for the ID, name, description, sequence, and features, and it's then breaking this file apart into its con constituent components. For us, the most important one is this seek, which is uh, showing you the first bit of the sequence here, and it's going dot, 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 because obviously the sequence is much longer than it can display here. And it also tells you what kind of sequence it is. In BioPython, single letter alphabet means that it's DNA. Okay? Um, so now, this MyDNA is an object, it is a structure that contains these values inside it. So I want to obviously work with just the sequence. I don't need the ID and anything else like that. So I'm going to declare another variable called MyDNA sequence. And I'm going to set that to my DNA's dot seek. Okay? Now this pulls out just the sequence from my DNA. So it will just pull out this line and allocate it to this variable. Okay? Again, if there are errors, you know you've done something wrong. So, so far we're doing okay. Um, now if I print, uh, actually let's just check my DNA sequence and that should just be that one line, which is just the line here. Okay? Of course, we can print the actual sequence itself. Uh, now, this is printing the entire sequence as just a text uh, in text format. All right, so this is what we need now. So we've got this MyDNA sequence. And remember the first thing I said was we want to convert this to RNA first before we can convert it to a protein. BioPython lets us do this, okay? So I'm going to store the RNA, the intermediate RNA, in a variable called myRNA, and I'm going to say MyDNA sequence dot transcribe. This is a function inside BioPython. Now, if I print my RNA, notice that all the T's have been converted to U's. So remember, if you think back to your biology, DNA has thiamine as a nucleic acid, which is then replaced by uracil in RNA. Okay, so all the T's have been replaced by U's. Everything else stays the same. The A's and the G's and the C's will stay the same. But that's the first step. Now what do we do after this? We want to convert now this to a protein sequence. But uh, I just want to show you what the actual full structure looks like. Note that the single letter alphabet has now become an RNA alphabet. So BioPython has detected by this transcribe function that we are converting this to RNA, and it's said that it's an RNA alphabet. So immediately, if you just had the sequence and you didn't know what it was, simply printing it out tells you a lot about it. Okay? Now we want to convert this to a protein. So my protein, my RNA dot, can you guess? From DNA to RNA, it was transcribe. So from RNA to protein, it is translate. Fingers crossed. Good. Now, looking at my protein, well, that looks a little bit different, doesn't it? No more A's, T's, C's, G's, and U's. We are now looking at the one-letter amino acid codes. 
And notice that from the RNA alphabet, we've gone to the extended IUPAC protein, which is how BioPython identifies protein sequences. Of course, if I say print my protein, it's going to print the amino acid sequence. So what we have just done is we have taken a DNA sequence and we've converted to RNA and we've gotten the resulting protein. So remember our DNA sequence was unknown. So what are we left with? We are left with the unknown protein sequence now. But this could still be useful. Okay, so I'm now going to quit this. Oh, before we do that, I did want to uh, also look at the lengths. So let's say, uh, let's go back to our DNA sequence here. Now, I don't want to count this. I want to know how many bases there are. I just really don't want to count this, okay? But we still have access to these variables, my DNA, my RNA, and uh, my protein. So I'm just going to say print uh, len of my DNA sequence. That tells me that the length of this sequence here is 426 nucleic acids. Now, because RNA is a direct one-to-one -one replacement, um, you should have the same number. Good, that makes sense. Can you guess what it would be for the proteins? Ready with your guess? Does that make sense? Well, it's shorter. We can see it's shorter. What is the relationship between 142 and, the, and 426? Think about it. This is just your basic biology. And think about why pro the protein sequence would, would naturally be smaller than the RNA or the DNA sequence. OK, so that was my example. I'm now going to quit IPython. And uh, now you might be thinking, well, do I really have to go through the, all of this typing every single time? Well, no, Python lets me uh, store a uh, script which has all these lines stored in it. So if I run, so let's let's just take a look at the script actually, dna 2 prod and Vim is just my text editor. So this is uh, the first line which says run this with Python and I've done exactly this from BioPython import uh, seek.io, my DNA equals none, we parse this file, uh, we assign it to my DNA, we transcribe, we translate, and then I've also printed out the description from the original DNA and the, my, uh, the protein sequence itself. So if I run this, I can run it by just saying Python, DNA to protpy, it's going to run all those steps and it's going to print out the two things I've asked it to print, which are the uh, FASTA header or the description and the sequence itself, which should be the same as this sequence here. So I hope this was a, uh, a simple and, a, and an easy to understand example of how I can use Python and BioPython to go from a, a FASTA file in DNA format to the resulting protein. Okay. <coughs> Remember, we still don't know what this uh, sequence is, so we're going to try to answer that question uh, in a little bit. Okay, let's get back to our slides here. Now, this what we actually did was very profound. We have done something in a computer that every single cell in your body does naturally. Think about it. You've got DNA inside the nucleus that then gets transcribed to mRNA, micro, uh, sorry, messenger RNA, that then comes out of the cell, uh, cell nucleus, and then gets translated with the ribosomal machinery and the uh, transfer RNA, the tRNA, the blue thing here is the ribosome. The tRNA comes in, docks, and then produces uh, the growing peptide chain or protein chain. So in two lines in BioPython, we have done DNA to RNA, which is the transcription, then we have done the mRNA to the actual uh, amino acid, which is the translation. So think about that. It's actually very profound what we just did in two lines in BioPython. Okay, let's move on to uh, the main protein sequence database that uh, you will probably be encountering in this class, um, and that's called Uniprod. So you could go to Uniprod and obtain these FASTA files uh, of protein sequences um, just like I've shown you in the past. <coughs> Pardon me, quick sip of water there. So Uniprot is the definitive protein sequence resource. <coughs> and it's actually an umbrella project. It's composed of a database called Uniprot KB, or Uniprot Knowledge Base, which contains the protein sequences that you would be interested in. It also contains some other databases. 
and it's actually a collaboration between uh, three projects and three stations, uh, three sites around the world. Uh, the EMBL EBI is the European Molecular Biology Lab EBI Outstation, or the European Bioinformatics Institute, and that's in Cambridge, which is a place that uh, people from Oxford don't like to talk about, but it is there here in the UK. Um, the uh, second place is the Swiss Institute for Bioinformatics, the SIB, and the Protein Information Resource, which was, uh, I believe, an American collaboration initially. And Uniprot is cross-referenced by all other major databases. So GenBank, which has uh, nucleic acid data, PDB, which has protein structures, and PubMed, which has publications. All of the sequences in uh, GenBank and PDB and PubMed all refer back to the Uniprot um, cross-reference. And in fact, 95% of the data in Uniprot KB comes from the translation of nucleic acid sequences submitted to GenBank. How, so how is this done? Well, we just looked at an example of doing exactly that. So there are bioinformaticians who have written scripts that uh, monitor GenBank. And anytime there's a new nucleic acid sequence that's submitted to GenBank, they have scripts very similar to the one I just wrote in front of your eyes to convert that to an amino acid sequence and then deposit it into Uniprot. Of course, it then goes through rigorous curation to ensure that it's correct and everything like that. But essentially, this is another place where bioinformatics uh, and scripting comes into play. Uh, and this is a hyperlink to uh, the about page for Uniprot. It goes into much more detail about these three sites and uh, what some of the data is uh, in Uniprot. And I just think, you know, in your spare time, when you're studying for uh, this course or looking at uh, some of the examples that we will go through, uh, just take a gander at the about page because it does have some very interesting information. Um, I just want to touch on Uniprot sequence categories. So, like I said, it collects 95% of the sequences from uh, nucleic acid depositions in GenBank. So, how can you confirm that a sequence that you look at in Uniprot is of a certain quality? Well, they have this score called protein existence, okay? Uh, and it goes, uh, it's just PE1, PE2, 3, 4, and 5, okay? And this is directly measured by the evidence that's available for a given protein. So PE1 is the highest score, which means that for a given sequence, it had, there is evidence at the protein level. So the protein has been observed, it's been identified by mass spec or crystallography, other experimental techniques. So we are pretty darn sure that this sequence is correct. Uh, and PE5 is for unknown proteins or hypothetical proteins or just maybe badly uh, refined proteins where we just don't have enough information yet. But um, this is just a quick look into the curation inside Uniprot. So there are five categories of curation. And uh, there is another help page called Dubious Sequences and you can click on this and go there uh, in your spare time and read more about this uh, scoring system. Okay, time now for a demo of Uniprot actually. So I'm going to uh, open up the Uniprot website in a second and I'm going to show you a couple of uh, its features and just show you what it looks like. Um, but actually, I want to use it for identifying our unknown protein that we translated from the DNA earlier uh, in the Python example. So Uniprot comes with a version of BLAST. So I'm not sure if you have yet discussed BLAST. I think you might have uh, discussed it last week. But um, BLAST is a local alignment uh, searching program so you can pass it a sequence and it has an internal database in this case the database is composed of all the Uniprot sequences um, and it gives you uh, the biggest uh, or the best hits to whatever it finds in its database so using this if we have an unknown sequence we can blast it against a database like Uniprot and we can uh, possibly identify what uh, the unknown sequence is. So I'm just going to grab the web browser again. And we're going to go to Uniprot's main web page. So this is what the Uniprot main web page looks like, okay? I'm just going to zoom in a little bit as well, just so it's more clear for you. Uh, and they have actually just changed the, the new design. It's actually very nice to, uh, to use now. So 
Guniprot KB is composed of two projects called Swissprot and Tremble, and again, the About page tells you all about how that uh, that's structured. Um, it also contains these other uh, databases called Uniref, Unipark, and Proteomes. Unipark, again, for the person who had the question on uh, archiving data and superseding with better quality data, Unipark maintains all the data that Uniprot has had in the past, including all the old obsoleted data as well. Uh, and this is the metadata. Here's some supporting data. So you can search for literature on a certain uh, sequence. You can look at taxonomy. You can cross-reference against other databases. You can read about some diseases and special keywords and locations where proteins occur. So this is, this is a very good example of metadata that's attached to the data inside a database, okay? Now, as I mentioned, uh, there is a BLAST feature on the Uniprot website, which finds regions of similarity between sequences. Uh, you can also just directly uh, find something in Uniprot if you know what the ID is. Uh, and there's an alignment. If you have two or more sequences, you can look at how similar they are using uh, the Clustal program. So Clustal is another very uh, useful bioinformatics package that um, we will probably discuss later in the course. Um, okay, so let us, uh, by the way, the help page here, um, just to quickly show you, this is where you see the about page and uh, the other page on dubious sequences as well will be found here. So this is actually an interesting place. Whenever you go to a, a web service like Uniprot or PDB or PubMed, read a little bit about the history because it's uh, it's often very colorful and uh, it's all about different projects getting together and uh, putting their data together into a single resource. So um, this is generally a very useful place to start if you are on a new web service. So I highly recommend going there. But for today, um, we are going to go to the BLAST section because Uniprod has a BLAST that uh, that works with its database. So the target database here is the Uniprod KB. And there are some other choices as well. But we want to compare against all of Uniprod KB. Okay, I'm going to leave all the extra uh, the extra parameters um, just as the defaults here. We can get into all of this stuff later. This is all just heavy mathematics and bioinformatics. And But for now, for most test uh, testing sequences, the basic uh, parameters should be okay. So we need to put our sequence in here, so let's go get it. I'm just going to grab my terminal. And I'm going to run my Python script again to pull out the sequence. Here it is. I'm just going to paste that in there and run blast. And this is going to take a little while, because obviously there are thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, sequences inside Uniprot KB. Um, so this will take a little while, but BLAST is actually a very quick algorithm, given how many sequences it has to compare against. Um, so that's why it's so popular, is because it can take a massive database and still do a pretty decent job at... Uh, aligning and uh, comparing sequences uh, quite quickly. BLAST-P is uh, the protein version. So because we're dealing with an amino acid sequence here, uh, BLAST-P is the variant of the BLAST uh, algorithm. OK, that was pretty good. Um, now, this is a little score here. This is the results page. This is a score that says we have from 100% identity all the way down to 0. This is a legend. OK. And here is the overview. So this is really where you want to kind of focus your attention initially, OK? And look at this. We have 100% identity. That means this was a 100% match to these four and possibly more, um, five sequences, OK? And what are they? OK, well, this is a putative uncharacterized protein. So we'll ignore all the putative ones. It means it's a uh, potential or it's a uh, hypo hypothetical protein. <clears throat> Hypothetical proteins, just as a side note, are derived exactly like we derived the protein sequence with our Python example. So if you've got some exotic DNA and uh, you think it codes for a protein but you don't know the protein se sequence, you can run uh, the Python script that we just wrote and you can pull up a sequence. But of course, there is no evidence to back this up. However, I like this. Look at this. Um, and the reason I like this one 
is because it has a little star here. So Swissprot is one of the projects that contributes to Uniprot. And Swissprot is very, very manually, heavily curated. So people go in and spend a lot of time and effort verifying the correctness. So with Uniprot, I generally like to look at um, the Swissprot reviewed sequences. And you've got hemoglobin subunit alpha from one species here. Bonus marks if you can tell me what that is. Panpaniscus and Homo sapiens. Okay, so this is the human hemoglobin. And it's got a 100% hit to it. And can you think of two other creatures? If you don't know what pan troglodytes and pan paniscus are, can you think of two creatures that are closely related to humans that could have the same kind of hemoglobin in them? <laughs> Should be pretty easy to guess now. Um, so this is definitely hemoglobin. So I think we have identified our unknown protein. So this is an example of using Uniprot to very quickly um, find out what an unknown protein is, an unknown sequence. Quick summary before we end today. Um, if you're writing your own code, I would say Python is the best one to start with. As we saw, it was very, very quick and easy to take a DNA sequence, parse it using BioPython, pull out the RNA, pull out the protein, copy-paste the protein into Uniprot, uh, the BLAST, uh, BLAST um, page in Uniprot, and then pull out um, what the protein actually is. So that didn't take us very long. So I think Python is definitely the best language for you to start learning if you're looking to learn a programming language. Um, yes, BioPython, excellent, excellent module to, uh, to have installed with your Python. Makes it very easy to interact with biological data. Um, we looked at a very quick example today of uh, looking at unknown DNA and we simulated cell machinery. So we didn't just take text and convert it to text and convert it to more text. We actually simulated transcription and translation as the cell does it. And we also looked at Uniprot, which is the main uh, database for protein sequences. And we looked a little bit at navigating the website. And finally, on the Uniprot page, we used the BLAST algorithm to find out what our unknown protein sequence was. And therefore, we can also conclude that our unknown DNA sequence uh, is directly responsible for producing the protein for hemoglobin. So that, comes to, uh, that concludes my uh, lecture for this day. Now, I just want to address one last thing. There, uh, there have been some reports from students about how it would be nicer if you could interact with me. And I completely understand and agree. Uh, unfortunately, Tuesdays, are, uh, it's very difficult for me to get out of work to uh, do the lectures live. But I'm going to endeavor to do the lectures live on Friday, whenever I have a Friday slot. Uh, I'm also looking at uh, idling in a WebEx chat or something like that during your tutorials and your lab sessions so that uh, I will be available to answer any questions via chat. Uh, inside a WebEx page or um, some other medium. So don't worry, I am, I am very conscious of the fact that some of you would like more interaction with me and uh, I'm doing everything possible to try to make that happen. Uh, and finally, please continue emailing me any questions. I actually have received no direct emails from anybody. Uh, don't be afraid. This, <laughs> this is a course that uh, it, it's very important for you to engage with your instructors. Uh, especially when you are uh, when your instructors are all over the place and you know obviously I would love to come face to face and uh, lecture for you in person but since we don't have that luxury the next best thing we can do is to communicate via text and email uh, so on my end I'm going to endeavor to be present in some sort of live uh, text-based form uh, if I cannot do the lectures live but uh, on your end, I would really appreciate hearing from you by email if you have any questions. And uh, I hope this presentation addressed some of your concerns from last week, and I hope it was more enjoyable and more engaging. And uh, like I said, please keep sending in feedback. I will continue altering my presentations as required, as the consensus demands it, uh, so that um, at the end of the day, you get an enjoyable experience and you get to uh, learn something useful. So um, without further ado, I am going to uh, let you go away and think about this. And um, please do email me with, uh, with your questions. Excellent. Thanks very much.